Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Soulful Show. So today I have on Danielle Russ, who is a wife, a mother, an entrepreneur, and she is also someone that came out of the new age. And we actually met years ago through a Reiki share. So that's how we initially connected. And then around the same time, we both came out of the section of the new age. So now she's here to share her testimony, and I'm so excited to hear it, along with share some of the personal experiences I also had with a mentor that was working with her for the Reiki and the mediumship as well. So Danielle, thank you for being here. Uh, Thanks for having me. So at what age did you begin practicing different new age modalities and kind of get seduced by this alternative spirituality and healing industry? Um, As far as like in my career that started uh, when I was 28, but I always had a little bit of it kind of instinctually and intertwined throughout my childhood and adulthood. And um, I think I just kind of really dove in when I was 28 though. Okay. And so did you have a personal relationship with Jesus growing up or were you Christian, your family? Mm -hmm. What did that look like? Um, Our family was Christian. We didn't attend church regularly. Um, We had moved from the city to a small town. And um, in a lot of ways, we were just different than our like really small rural community. Um, And I felt like it was just another way that we were kind of different, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But we did Bible study at home. Um, I wouldn't say that we were like overly religious or really overly anything, but, um, yeah. So I, I had what I thought was a personal relationship with Jesus, like as a teenager. And then I think as like, you kind of get into peer pressure and things like that, I started to back away from it because I felt like it was making me seem maybe unaccepting of others. And, you know, we all just want to be liked. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. There's a huge stereotype around Christians, um, along with prejudice and persecution, which I didn't realize until I went all in for Jesus and started publicly speaking about Jesus. Then I started receiving all this backlash, especially from those that are still in the new age, which is really interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, absolutely. I think that there's this sense of not wanting to share too much, especially when you're working in alternative healing. And uh, that was my experience as well. Not wanting to be very public about my relationship with Jesus. But if someone asked, I would tell them I'm Christian. But in reality, looking back, I was a lukewarm Christian, like a very, Mm -hmm. very lukewarm Christian, of course. So what practices did you gravitate towards and engage in most during that time? Um, I was really interested in philosophy, like since probably my high school year. So I think there was a lot of um, having like inner peace and things that revolved around that. Um, There were parts of the new age that I was kind of like, okay, that's not for me. Like I never got into like crystals or astrology very much, but um, I was very much into meditating, um, learning about the chakras and doing energy work. Um, I was like into Oracle cards, but not tarot cards. So I would say that I I participated in a lot of these things, but I still felt like there was a falseness within new age and that the parts I was choosing were the right ones type thing. And I think that there's a lot of that, like pridefulness, even though it's around surrendering your ego and going beyond it. So still very ego centered. Oh, absolutely. I called it like spiritual narcissism. I've heard people Mm -hmm. um, call new age because it is, it's pick and mix spirituality. So you, you can, and it's just this huge smorgasbord of pulling different practices from different religions, like shamanism, Buddhism, Taoism, Mm -hmm. even Christianity. And so Mm -hmm. because of that, it's that pantheistic worldview of all roads lead to God. And Mm -hmm. as long as I'm not doing the overtly occult practices, like the um, tarot cards, like you had mentioned, or astrology, mediumship, psychics, but I even started 
I would go to some of those things and do some of those things. And it's like, I had this internal conflict, like something doesn't feel right here. But then when I would stick with like meditation, breath work, uh, energy healing, even I felt more at peace with those things. But even so, like looking back, there was still resistance and I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you tell us about, I know plant spirit communication was one of the <laughs> uh, modalities that you got into. So can you tell us a little bit about what that entails? Yeah. Um, so I think like the things that I chose to go with and the things that I think a lot of people do is like you see certain things as being dark and certain things as being this is light this is okay there's even in plant medicine you can you know that there are people who do it in a dark way and there are people who do it in a light way and I'm not talking herbalism um, because this is specifically having to do with energetics and spirituality. Um, I do believe that herbalism is good. There's a lot of plants that are really beneficial for our body's natural chemistry and design. Um, but this was communicating with the plant realm um, and seeking healing and guidance from plant entity or plant spirits um, for energetic layers of ourselves, um, things that needed to be healed, uh, things like there were different plants that could help with like confidence, help with sleep, help with staying grounded in your sleep. If you're someone who has like really vivid, lucid dreams and you just want to get a good night's sleep, um, things for gosh, uh, dealing with trauma and grief. And so it started out as learning how to communicate with a plant. Um, but then as we like got deeper into it, it was learning how to communicate with a plant spirit, even when the plant isn't there. Um, so it's almost like the plants have like this cedar tree spirit. It's the spirit of the cedar tree. Like it could be every cedar tree and the cedar tree has, um, a lot of grounding and, um, of course, like biblical importance, like with bringing in things from like religions, how you were saying. And I think a lot of that gives you comfort because you might flip into the Bible and you're like, oh yeah, they do talk about cedar trees a lot. And this is like a sacred, you know, like mm -hmm. kind of twisting scripture um, or just really not knowing the full extent of it. So um, eventually, you know, we were doing plant essences. So that's like ingesting part of the plant and then meditating with it and receiving messages. Um, and then going on shamanic meditation journeys and meeting the plant spirit and things. Um, and I didn't do too much of that because, um, once I started delving into that, I actually was saved pretty soon after. So Okay. But I had like some pretty vivid <laughs> experiences the last like four months of mm -hmm. doing that. So mm -hmm. absolutely. And it is, it's this idea of if you can have this out of body experience, mm -hmm. alter your state of consciousness. And this is why I warn about altering your state of consciousness in any form, whether that's through meditation, whether that's through altering your breath, which is what I taught. Uh, or whether it's through drugs and psychedelics, which many people are calling plant medicine, you know, doing ayahuasca and mm -hmm. um, bufa and all of these things. Mushrooms is huge and it leaves you spiritually vulnerable mm -hmm. when you're not of sound mind. When you go and you literally astral project, leave your body it, mm -hmm. to communicate with these spirit plant spirits, whatever it is, it's what shamans would do, which is do sorcerers, uh, because they're trying to get information from these spirits. And really, we just we know now that these spirits are demons in disguise, right? Like Corinthians 2 11, 14 for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And so of course, like looking back, you can dismantle all of that. But when you're in it, you truly believe I'm doing this for the benefit of myself and for the benefit of others. I want to help other people deepen their healing. That's how I saw it. And mm -hmm. I really had pure intentions 
Um, yeah. But unfortunately, the enemy doesn't care about our intentions. <laughs> uh, so it can become dangerous. But did you have a lot of encounters with these like spirits, these plant spirits? Mm-hmm. And did you ever experience spiritual warfare? Like now looking back at that time, or Mm -hmm. was it always kind of this light and love type of experience? Um, For the most part, it was very like light and love. And I think the way that our society is structured now that we're all craving a little more of a natural existence with our natural world. Um, So I think that with those intentions of trying to be more peaceful and more respectful to stewarding this earth, like in a responsible way, like, I think that that was what was motivating a lot of us. Um, And the group of, you know, it was all women that we were together, super nice, just wonderful women that I still love. Um, And you know, we would go on these journeys together. And there were times where we were all getting the same message, like afterwards, when we'd meet up. So it, for that, like, it really confirmed it for me, like, oh, my gosh, like, wow, this is like, how did I not know? Like, I felt like my life had been completely changed. Like, I couldn't have like a plant around me without, like, looking at it like a living spirit like and you know it wasn't like I was getting like these really clear auditory messages but I was having dreams um with the plants um it just like the things were working and a lot of the messages that I received were very like childlike and lighthearted and like flower child and that is what appealed to me you know so I think that there's also this element of the spirits will tell you what you want to hear, what's going to appeal to you, what's going to make you feel safe. If you're into darkness, they'll be dark. (laughs) If you're looking for, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, that's the message that they're going to give you. Um, I would ingest, you know, like some, uh, sorry, flower essences. And I would like write down, like get quiet and like meditate and uh, come up with like these, these very like spiritual ideas that all the other new agers were also having the same revelation at the same time. And so it's like very clear that there's this underlying, there's like a new gospel being spread of like a new religion right now. And I think that's very interesting. And now looking back at it and at the time I had received it as confirmation, but now I'm receiving it as confirmation as a, for another agenda going on. Um, there was one experience that I had like on a shamanic journey where um, I met with the plant Rosemary and the uh, Rosemary, I think she was, it's like weird that I don't even remember, but it was a really vivid experience. And she was um, like a mother figure for me spiritually. And in this journey, she told me that I was from the angelic realm. And like, while I'm in the vision, I just started bawling not really physically, but like just crying inside, like this sense of relief and this sense of embarrassment at the same time, like it was a really weird experience. And then afterwards I shared with the group and it didn't really phase them because I felt like they were in it. They had, they had been in this longer than I had. And they're like, Oh, of course you're from the angelic realm. They were very like confirming for me. Very like, didn't treat me like I was saying something super strange. Um, But while I was telling them, I just started bawling. And I'm like, what do I do with this information? Um, And in that vision, um, Rosemary had told me that my angel name was Abea. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's the way I heard it. And I looked up what that meant. (laughs) And I'm pretty sure it was Aramaic and that it meant refuge. Or it also could mean cloak which I was like mind blown because in that meeting we were talking about like the cloak of um, it was either mother Mary or Mary Magdalene. And, but on a personal note, I, I don't know how many times I have said that I wanted to be a refuge for people. And, you know, I think that that's not unique in being a healer or, you know, like a person in healing modalities, like you just, we all feel so much for people's pain and anxiety and just wish to like embrace other people and be a refuge for them. 
but like specifically that wording. And so that was more of just like, whoa, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I didn't know a lot about angels even at that point. And there were times where it's like a lot of the people that I worked with, they had their angels that they called on a lot. And I'm like, well, I don't call on angels. Like, do I believe in angels? And so it was kind of like, I was really, I was very going very quickly, deeper and deeper into this, like mm -hmm. just from all the different things that you pull from your community. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, it is, it's interesting that the angels, the spirit guides, people, when you get into these modalities and you're being trained in these modalities, you're often mm -hmm. taught to call upon your, um, spiritual team for mm -hmm. the healing and the betterment of the person that you're working with. And so again, all of these people, they really do have, like you said, this very strong desire to help others. And they truly believe that what they're doing and tapping into is for the better good of who they're working with. And they just want to see their client happy and healed and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it is very seducing to believe that we can interact with the spirit realm and you feel special because you're mm -hmm. interacting with the spirit realm and you were chosen to be a healer and mm -hmm. to bring this new wave of enlightenment and helping people raise their consciousness and using, like you said, the plant allies to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and many people, um, get wrapped up into that. And then also it, it puts a heavy burden on you feeling like you have to just keep learning more and more trainings, more certifications, you know, so you can continue to quote unquote deepen your healing, but then also help your clients heal as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. It was like, no matter what I learned, like there was that moment of like, wow, I have this new tool in my toolbox but still feeling incredibly inadequate to actually help anyone. And I think like the biggest like one of the biggest cringes that I have now looking back is when you're in the position of trying to help someone heal, they're in such a vulnerable place and they're grieving, they're lost, they're looking for answers. And to have somebody come to me and trust me. And then for me to like invite demons into their life, like it's heartbreaking, like mm -hmm. looking back at it. And, um, it's like, I'm really ashamed of that because I consider myself to be a very level-headed person and to be so deceived, you just kind of like, oh man, like, mm. I can't believe that I, that I was leading people astray. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I literally, I remember the moment that I realized as well, that everything I had been practicing, promoting, teaching for so long was all a lie. And not only was it a lie, it was also demonic and evil at the same time. And I literally felt, I just remember being on the couch, like in a fetal position, feeling like I was going to puke, like physically feeling so ill <laughs> and mm -hmm. feeling that shame and that regret and, um, just realizing everything I had done. And yeah, of course, like I had, I go back to the enemy doesn't care about our intentions. And so unfortunately he does prey on these people who you're seeking your own healing. You believe you can heal yourself. You truly believe that there's tools and answers out there and you become very desperate for that. So you begin searching and you feel, okay, I'm healing myself. I'm becoming more enlightened. You receive that validation like you did in those visions where the angels quote unquote are telling you specific messages that are so hit mm -hmm. so close to home. You're like, this cannot be coincidence. I had so many of those exact same types of situations and visions but mm -hmm. that's why they're called familiar spirits in the Bible, because they're very familiar with every aspect of your life. That's what they're um, designed to do. And so when you have this spirit following you around and knowing everything about your life, of course, those coincidences come up again and again and again these quote unquote signs, um, all mm -hmm. around you. I get, Oh, these signs from the universe. I'd see angel numbers or see a, a cardinal or I see a butterfly. And, oh yes. I'm on the right path. I'm doing the right thing because the universe is giving me a sign. And it's mm -hmm. just like, Oh my gosh, such a deception. I remember like after being saved, like receiving signs still, but like ignoring them and just feeling like, a huge burden, like, oh, I don't have to like interpret that. And then like, they just stopped. Mm -hmm. But even now, even here and again, like I do get 
things where it's just like pops up like, Hey, like, look at this, like, look at that. And I'm just like, no, I just, I don't. Um, mm-hmm. so that was like a really, a big relief for me. And like, once I got rid of all of my stuff and threw it away, like the lightness that I felt was just like, Oh my gosh, like this stuff was weighing on me so bad. And I didn't even know, you know, like all the stuff that's all in your home. And like, I still find things here and there. I'm like, how did I miss this? And like, so. Oh yeah, I know. Going through everything. I went through my basement, the boxes, everything. I also still mm-hmm. randomly, I'll find like a random crystal or a, a random, a random um, sage bundle. I'm like, okay, this has to go. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah, it's wild how that works. And I felt the same, like a huge burden off my shoulders. There's a verse in the Bible about how when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. And so mm-hmm. when those, when those signs from quote unquote angels try to come in, and um, allure you back in, or you find a smudge or a yoga book, it's like, just throw it out because you resist him and he will flee from you. And that's exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the correlation because both of us were huge into Reiki, but the Mm -hmm. correlation between Reiki or energy healing and the story of Simon, the sorcerer in the book of acts, because this is something that you actually brought to my attention. And then when I read the story, I was like, all these ahas and light bulb moments were going off in my head. Um, I think like, so to provide a little background, um, without like giving you a too long of a story, um, in my twenties, I renounced Christianity. I still always had like this respect for Jesus, but I was so like sure that nobody really knew who the real Jesus was like, because of so many negative experiences I had, like with churches and, you know, people, you know, who are supposed to be Christian and stuff. So, you know, I always still kept like this respect for Jesus and the Holy spirit, but I was set on my own way to find him. Um, and so like with doing energy work, I think that people who respect Jesus or consider themselves Christians, um, that there is still this like maybe comfort in seeing like, well, Jesus healed, like with the laying on of hands and, I've, I've even read some people online, like saying like, Jesus did Reiki. (laughs) And I'm like, no, he didn't. But, um, you know, like you have to pay to get this attunement and you have to charge for it as this energy exchange. And that's another thing, like people in like the, the healing space, like there are some modalities that you feel really wrong charging for but we all assure each other, you have to charge. Like this is an exchange for your time. And if you're going to dedicate yourself to this spiritual practice and really become all that you're going to be, like you have to invest your time and we all need to eat. We all need to pay our bills. Like, so the fact though, that you have to pay to receive this training in the book um, and acts, I think it's chapter 13 or eight. I wrote it down. It's uh, mm-hmm. Acts 8, 17 through 23. Um, Simon the sorcerer, he um, sees, uh, was it Peter and Peter and John, Peter and John um, laying their hands on people and for them to be receiving the Holy Spirit. He was just like really blown away. And he's offered them money. He's like, you, you got to teach me how to do this. Like people are already following me with my sorcery. Like this is like awesome. Um And they were incredibly offended and they, you know, basically told him to take a hike. So the fact though, is you can't charge for the Holy spirit. You can't receive it by buying it. And so to compare the two things and to feel that what you're doing is another thing, invoking the Holy spirit to heal people. I was guilty of (laughs) believing that I was doing that. Um, And it's just not the same, like at all. So no, you can invoke demons. You cannot invoke the Holy spirit. The Holy spirit is sovereign. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting when I received my Reiki attunement with the same person that we did the Reiki shares with, um, I remember feeling this dark presence come over me. I was sitting down when she did the, this attunement 
And I felt all of a sudden very dizzy. I felt this out of body experience. Um, like I might fall over when I tried to stand up, I was feeling wobbly. I was feeling very out of it. Something did not feel right. And then I learned later that, um, there's spiritual impartation, which Paul talks about in the new Testament, where it's this transference of spiritual gifts that, um, you can do with, within the body of Christ in the church. And there's such a thing as demonic impartation. I didn't realize. So looking back, that was a demonic impartation when she laid her hands on me and she's, you know, doing this Sanskrit over me in the air, uh, and saying these different, um, words in Japanese, the Reiki, you know, lineage, then that was a demonic impartation because after that experience, I all of a sudden could channel, I could feel energy like I couldn't before people mm -hmm. when they would lay on my bed for a Reiki session, they would say, oh, wow, I feel the energy so powerfully running through me, or I can feel this, I can feel that. And I would put my hands over them and I could see certain things in the spirit. Like I would have this um, channel download of, oh, this message is from a loved one or um, this is why you're sick or what have you. And that was all demon power. And so looking back, it's so crystal clear, but when you're in it again, you truly believe, okay, I can just call upon my angels. I can call upon Jesus. I can pray and use the Holy spirit for this healing mm -hmm. session, but that's not who's partake participating in that healing session. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny that you would mention like the feeling dizzy and having difficulty standing because um, when I first started doing Reiki, I had that same experience of um, like feeling like the room was tilting and rocking kind of um, if that's how you felt. And what's really interesting is when I was in middle school, maybe like sixth or seventh grade, I went to a birthday party and we watched the craft. And after we watched it, like some of the girls went like to go do something else, but then like two girls stayed in the room and they started practicing like seances and stuff. And I was on my way out of the room. I was never interested in that type of thing. And I collapsed on the ground. And I remember like crawling on the floor to get behind a chair. And I just, I couldn't stand up and the ground was rocking and spinning like that. And I was just like, whoa, like this is terrifying. And as soon as I could get up, I was like out of there. Um, and then I felt that again, when I was doing Reiki and I dismissed it, but I remember going back to that memory and being like, boy, like this feels exactly how I felt the one time when they were doing mm -hmm. witchcraft in the, in the room, but I dismissed it. And I thought, oh, well, maybe this is just what it means to be like having like a really spiritual, like being really in the, like a spiritual Zen, like consciousness, um, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it's, I've had so many experiences. I would experience, um, a lot of anxiety when I was working with people and I didn't know why, like why, when I entered into their energy body, would I start experiencing heart palpitations and all this weird anxiety and fear out of nowhere when it wasn't mental, it was all physical too. So I also had very weird situations like that. And I just remember feeling very out of alignment with many of the things that my Reiki master was telling me to do. Like, again, and all of these symbols and that you would do in the air, all these different um, affirmations and things that you would say, you, you're told to call in your spirit guides and mm -hmm. whoever that was. And so when you're invoking these spirit guides, those are familiar spirits. Those are demons that you're invoking. Other um, Reiki master teacher I worked with, she had me put like this grid, like sacred geometry underneath the Reiki table, like printed mm -hmm. off and put it there. So, uh, it looking back, like that's all witchcraft, like that mm -hmm. is heavy witchcraft. And mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm like, how did I not see it before? But again, I mean, the enemy, he's so sneaky in the way he deceives and the way that Reiki came about in the first place, it was a Zen Buddhist monk in the mid 1800s that had a psychic experience and was channeled this information of Reiki. And of course we know mediumship and channeling psychic experiences. Those are all an abomination to the Lord and, um, talked about often in the Bible as such. And so, yeah, it's just like all of those little red flags that you just dismiss, mm -hmm. even though you're like, something is not right here. Um, and 
it's, it is, it's unfortunate. I, the Reiki, I, um, very quickly, I was like, I don't feel right using that word. So I would change it and say, oh, it's just energy healing. Mm -hmm. And of course there's so many different types of (laughs) quote unquote energy healing. There's so many different modalities, whether it's crystal healing, shamanic healing, um, the grid healing, different frequency healing, like there's a million different names for it, but it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Let's get into um, why we need to be discerning of even massage therapists. <laughs> and because when I would, this is another discussion that we've had before, but I would go into my massage therapist's office, um, even here in the small town I live in now, and there would be a chakra tapestry, a full moon thing, crystals everywhere. And last time I went in there, I was like, I will never come in here again for a massage. Next time I'm just going to go to my chiropractor's office. (laughs) Why do we have to be discerning of, of even massage therapists? Um, I mean, I think just anybody who has like a very uh, like empathetic nature, um, and actually like the term that a lot of us used are that we're empaths, like that we're just more sensitive to other people's energies. And really, I think what it comes down to is that a lot of people that are drawn to doing massage therapy are they're really caring people and um, they have a desire to help people, to help people relax, to help with their pains. Um, and like myself, I didn't know scripture. Uh, I thought that people who read the Bible were just like uptight and like, why are you reciting these verses to me? You know, like, um, and you don't know what you're getting into. And I just think that, you know, in that circle of healers, you know, people who that's what they consider their profession is to be a healer there's this desire to just go beyond what your actual qualifications are. Um, So then you get these additional certifications um, and it's just really appealing. Like you just want to help people more. And so I think that there's just a tendency for, you know, when I think about all the massage therapists that I know, um, I can't think of many who are not also doing Reiki or also doing yoga or also doing, you know, all these other things. And that's, you know, I'm not, I was, you know, kind of nervous with this question because I'm not judging anybody, but I just, there, if you are trying to stay away from these things, you may have a hard time finding someone who is not involved in these things. Um, Do I think people need to be afraid if they are very strong in their faith and, you know, wearing their armor of God? you know, I I don't think that you need to go in like being fearful. No, none of these people are like, well, usually like no one's thinking that they're doing anything dark and they're not like, I remember somebody uh, asking me if another person who um, does these things, they're like, are they going to put a hex on me? And I'm like, no, (laughs) they're not like, but um it's just, it's just the community. It's, um, you know, I got into it because I started as an herbalist or learning herbal medicine. I did personal training and then I did massage therapy. And it's like, when I came down to it, I was just, I'm like, well, herbs can only help people so much. Like physical fitness can only help people so much like massage, like that helps with anxiety, but like, I just kept wanting to help more and like to help people on all the layers of themselves. Um, And I, before I knew it, I was creating my own religion somehow. So it's just Mm -hmm. like, you start off with the best intention. And unfortunately, a lot of these things are wolves in sheep clothing, the modalities. And especially when you, you know, like myself, I felt like I was someone, you can trust me. I have discernment. I am not going to get involved in anything that's dark. Mm -hmm. but I didn't know better. So, um, I think the best thing that people can do is really to just know scripture because when you, when you know scripture, you're able to kind of like determine like what's going on here when you encounter things. 
So I mm. think if, if you're someone who's vulnerable and you have an awesome massage, and then you really like your massage therapist and you build this relationship, but you don't have that discernment, um, they can quickly become the expert in your life to tell you how to take care of yourself. And it can become how to take care of yourself spiritually. Um, you know, and ultimately I really, that's God's area of expertise mm -hmm. and, yes. you know, looking back at it, what I wanted for people was salvation. And I'm like, I can't give that to you. Mm -mm. So no, exactly. And within massage therapy school, are there new age teachings that are kind of intertwined within that? Or is it just focused on the physical? And I'm sure it depends from school to school mm -hmm. where you go. It does. It, I mean, I would think it depends on school to school, but in general, I think that there is this curiosity for the energetic body um, and whether or not your curriculum has time to go over that, it may be included. Um, but the, the place where I went to school was a really nice blend of medical and like spa work. But we did also talk a little bit about, and this was just the personalities in the room, uh, law of attraction coming up. Uh, that was the first time I pulled Oracle cards. There were some in the building. Um, some of my classmates uh, f helped me find where I would get my Reiki training. Um, so, you know, it just really just depends on everybody's experience is going to be different. I know there's another school. Uh, I went to school in Grand Rapids. There is another school there that was like strictly medical, but I'm sure that you know, when you start to pull in like traditional Chinese medicine, there's just going to be a little bit of that element of Eastern philosophy too. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's kind of hard. Like I, like I do cupping, I do gua sha. These are two modalities that are traditional Chinese medicine and they're really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, but I leave them at that. I don't mm -hmm. take it beyond. And I think that that's the hard part. It's really tempting to take it further. Right. Absolutely. And it's, yeah, it's easy to all of a sudden slip into spiritual practices. Um, but as long as you're focusing just on the physical, there's really nothing wrong with that. And like you said, as long as you know, scripture, you can be discerning. You have the discernment of the Holy spirit. Once you're a born again believer, and that's been the most potent gift for me to discern, um, people and, experiences and to know if this is something I should be participating in with, because of course, after you've been deceived for so long, you're almost on high alert afterwards, like, yes. you know, on the lookout, cause you don't want to be bamboozled again. Um, mm -hmm. and so you feel just extra sensitive a little bit around everything. And mm -hmm. honestly, looking at back now, I would rather be extra sensitive and cautious of these things than ignorant and just willy nilly and, oh, whatever, let's just jump mm -hmm. in. So yeah, absolutely. It's a sensitive line because while I don't want to judge other people, especially because I was so deceived, um, I also don't want to affirm certain things that people are doing or like give them the green light. If someone were to ask me, like, that's really uncomfortable to tell someone, well, you know, like I actually disagree with this and it's because of that, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not looking to say like, you're sinning, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to be a stumbling block for people. So um, if people know that I'm a Christian and I want them to know that I am, I have a high standard set for myself in the things that I get associated with, because I would hate for somebody to see me in an environment where these things are accepted and then assume that I approve of them because they know like that I'm a Christian. Absolutely. So. Yeah, that's beautifully said. So tell us more about channeling and what that would look like for you when you were working with a client. Um, so I didn't really know what to call this, honestly, but that's the best des descriptor that I could give it, um, is like during meditations and energy work, um, and in my own personal practice of like, I would do tea ceremonies and, um, different meditations, like with or without plants. Um, there was this channeling of, you know, light energy where, and this is super common in meditations, like putting your roots into deep into the earth, opening the crown of your head to like have the, 
the beam of conscious light come into your body. <clears throat> and once you get in that state, like you're really there, um, this emptying yourself out, changing your vibration, you know, as far as that goes scientifically, I don't really know what was happening, but you have the somatic sensations of something's different. Like I'm really in this zone. Um, so there were times like a lot of my meditations dealt with opening up your crown to receive this energy, um, and have it like emanate through your body, have it create this orb around you. Um, and sometimes like I would do this personally while I'm doing energy work on someone to help open their chakras, to help balance things, to help, um, uh, my initial, like when I was kind of forming my own energy work, I did still did Reiki, but there were things I would pull into it myself and I didn't call it Reiki either. Um, I would be aiming to change someone's vibration to bring you back to your original state because, you know, we have this view of like, people are just out of balance, like that we're not where we're meant to be intrinsically. And this isn't how God created us. We're supposed to be, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there were times actually like, and I don't know if you want me to get into it yet, but like after being saved where I realized like how, like, like the, the experiences that I were having, like how dark they actually were, hmm. like at the time they felt like, okay, I'm here. Like I can do this. Like I'm in the, the right state of mind. And then, um, yeah, so, you know, I, it's hard to really explain what exactly was going on, but, um, you know, I understand now that it wasn't a good thing. So, so where do you believe that power, uh, came from the ability to have these really powerful visions and then also interpret for other people, what they were experiencing, um, or help people feel that energy that was flowing through them. Where do you mm -hmm. believe that was coming from? I mean, now that I look back, it's definitely a dark presence. Um, I don't know a lot about the spirit realm. You know, it, if anything, being saved helped me realize like how little I actually understood of the realm I was dabbling in. Um, from what I've learned so far, I would say that it was demonic. Um, there was, uh, I had started like really getting into studying the chakra system and doing energy readings on people from a distance. And part of this was a little bit like motivated because being a massage therapist, I'm like, I need to like offer different modalities that maybe I can do remotely to preserve my body and, you know, help people also on different levels. So I remember when I was just practicing this and, um, so when you get attuned into energy work, one of like the biggest rules is, is that you have to have someone's permission. And there, this was a time I didn't have someone's permission. It was somebody that I didn't really even know, but I knew that they were having a health problem. And I thought, I'm just going to like tune in just to see if I can like pick up on their energy. And I went through their chakras and found, you know, what I felt was like an imbalance. The next day I had the worst migraine of my life. And, um, when I, I get migraines like really sporadically and they'll last like three hours, maybe this lasted several days. Um, my eye afterwards, my left eye had like trauma from it where I couldn't look up or roll my eye. It felt bruised. And the vision in my eye was not normal for probably seven months. I even went to a neurologist about it because of my, it's like, it felt like a smudge on my eye. And then like, I tried to look and it was just like light, like coming in on that eye. And what was really interesting is I had this headache and I'm just like, when is this headache going to go away? Like what is wrong? And I had a dream. And in my dream, one of my trees that I worked with came to me and said, give me your headache. And I took in my dream, I took the headache out of my head and put it in the tree. And I remember in my sleep, my headache went away. And, you know, when you hear about other people's testimonies of like the, the demons can give you physical sensations. They can give you feelings of anxiety, feelings of lust, feeling of jealousy, like 
And if you don't have like a sound mind, you can easily identify with those feelings and then just be swept up in them. And I believe that this like physical infliction was from a presence, like a a demonic presence, I guess, because nobody could, I, I got an MRI, you know, I got tests done to see what was wrong. And they were like, we don't know what's wrong with your eye. I got, I went to the eye doctor to make sure it wasn't like, you know, like a vision thing. And the eye doctor was like, well, it's not your eye. It's gotta be your brain. And they looked at my brain. <laughs> it wasn't my brain. And so, um, that was like a really serious experience for me where I was like, uh, I maybe need to take a step back, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And then you had a similar experience when you were mentoring under someone for mediumship as well, where you felt really sick afterwards. Is that, is that the same experience Um, or is that different? I wasn't mentoring, but I, I just went to a medium. So a lot of this, like my spiritual, uh, path really like accelerated in November of 2021. I had just moved. I had a young, like a little baby. There were a lot of things in my life that were, they were shifting and in that sense, a little bit unstable uh, or unstable. And then, um, I think that I was just in a vulnerable place and I woke up one morning and I heard in my head, um, it's time to stop fooling around, step into your spiritual power type thing. But the voice was, it's time to stop fooling around. But I knew, I knew what it meant. It meant to like, get serious about your spiritual path. And I remember walking through my house and it was like, time was moving really slow. And like, I could see everything. Like it was like a super trippy experience. And I took it as, okay, like I need to take this serious. And, um, I remember like just getting these messages of like, you need to step outside first thing in the morning and announce your intentions to the earth for the day. And I, I didn't end up doing that because I was like, oh man, like I can't, I've got a baby and she freaks out and it's winter. Like, and I just remember having this thought process of like, what if that's God? Like, is that God telling me to do this? And then that thought became, what is my intuition and God, the same voice which is super dangerous. And, um, you know, there were times too, like, I'm sorry, I totally sidetracked. So I went to this, a medium, I'm in this new house and the house kind of reminded me of my grandma's house who had passed away. And I felt her presence. I'd be doing the dishes and like, she was there and I'm like, what is going on? Like, grandma, why are you here? And so I went to a medium and I didn't really get like any profound message other than, and this isn't even profound, but she just said, she just wants me to tell you that you're a really good mom. And I was like, okay. And I was like, that wasn't scary. Like everyone always says, like, don't contact the dead. Like, I was like, that wasn't scary at all. And that's the thing is a lot of it doesn't feel scary. Um, But I was in bed for three days after that. I was exhausted. And soon after that, around every full moon, I was in bed. And I was just like, wow, the full moon like really wipes me out. I got to the point where I was like scheduling work around not having to work when it was a full moon because I was just drained. Like I I couldn't be productive if I tried. So, it, you know. Yeah. When you, when you give legal rights to these familiar spirits, AKA demons, um, you, physically can feel their presence and you are really just a complete victim to them, unfortunately, uh, because of course they are much more powerful than we are, especially in the spirit. Uh, but ultimately Jesus has the final say. So thank you God for that. But absolutely. I experienced so many physical sensations, so many physical quote unquote illnesses that looking back came in while I was participating in these alternative healing sessions, uh, that really were, it was just witchcraft. And, um, so the witchcraft, I was giving myself binding to these demons, giving them legal entry into my life and into my body. 
And physically I was falling apart and getting sicker and sicker and sicker, which in turn made me rely on the healing modalities more and more and more. So it's this vicious cycle of oppression and deception that people get themselves in and truly bondage with the enemy and with these demonic forces that come against you and they come to you as light and love, but they will easily turn on you if something goes astray. Like I also thought I had invited in my grandfather and I would see him in dreams and I could maybe sometimes feel his presence. And then when I renounced all things new age, all of a sudden he would start coming to me in my dreams. But this time it was like, he was a zombie and he was scary looking and um, it was like eerie and there was fear. And I was like, okay, that was never my grandfather. That was a demon posing as my grandfather. And now the masks are off and he's showing himself for who he really is. Um, so I actually had to um, renounce all of that and receive deliverance so that I would stop having those nightmares where this zombie version of my grandfather was coming to me. Uh, so yeah, it's very real and very much uh, this physical affliction. I hear time and time again from people who get into the new age. It's very common. Mm -hmm. And the thing too, like with just them trying to appeal to you, I would have like really vivid dreams and I would have dreams about other people's lives. And you could tell, you can tell when it's a dream or when it's a vision. And, um, like I was knowing things about people that I had no business knowing, and it was very like unprovoked. It was just like out of nowhere. And I think like, as you keep getting all this, like proof of like, wow, this stuff is real. Like it just keeps kind of like pulling you in further and further. And I don't know how many people told me like, wow, like you're a real healer. Like you, like when I've had sessions before and it's nothing like when I'm with you, and I was like, wow, you know, like, okay, I've got a gift. Like, and I think part of it too, is I had read the book, um, I'm forgetting what it's called. It's like finding your zone of genius rather than like you have the zone of excellence and then you have the zone of genius. And I was like, well, I feel like, you know, this is my zone of excellence, but like, what is my zone of genius? And I kept getting like all this like affirmation that it was my healing ability, my spirituality. And, you know, I think, we're all like just trying to be the best versions of ourselves. And, you know, unfortunately that was what I thought was my best version. So. Oh, absolutely. The enemy will um, truly puff up your ego and make you feel again, like very special. I remember my, my first ever Reiki session, the woman that was doing it, she said, you have a golden aura of light surrounding you. You are a special light worker. You are gifted. You need to pursue this. And obviously that was, of course, a familiar spirit working through her to kind of nudge me in that direction. And sure enough, after that one Reiki session, it was like a floodgate for all of this other new age stuff that then came into my life, um, along with attack after attack after attack that I would blame on other consequences of life or my health um, at the time. But also I was receiving money. I was receiving clients. I was receiving more and more spiritual gifts. I was also being told you are such a powerful healer and people were coming to me, seeking me out in my my business just grew organically and it was booming. And so it's like the enemy will give you these gifts um, to, again, keep you in bondage because he knows the flesh, like he knows the human desire to have it all. And that's what manifestation is all about. If you believe you can be your own God and you can manifest everything you want in your life, why do you need the real God? You don't need the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that's why so many people who get into manifestation work, they do very well for themselves and they really do manifest everything that they want. Like I manifested so much within my life during that time. Um, and the enemy, he wanted me to stay in that, in that bubble of like mm -hmm. all of the stuff that I had accumulated and the success and the reputation. And I was very respected within my community and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so to give that up, takes a lot of humility and to give that up and then also talk about it at the same time, it's like, okay, there's going to be some backlash here. And I remember telling someone who was coming against me about saying all these things were evil and they're saying you're ignorant. You're just like the 
um, Pharisees and those that put Jesus on the cross. And of course I, you know, I know they don't know scripture, any of these things, because at one time I would have thought the same way, but Mm -hmm. I said to that person, I literally had everything to lose and nothing to gain except a relationship with Jesus and to be right with God. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people don't understand is like, why else would I literally be willing to give up a successful business and my entire, everything I worked for for the last seven years, if Mm -hmm. I wasn't that strongly convicted by God himself. Um, and it is, it's something that's so hard to explain when those scales are shed from your eyes, unless you've experienced it for yourself. So (laughs) what did that look like for you? Um, (laughs) So this is kind of where you come in <laughs> because I um I was about to come out with like all of this uh training that I was going to offer um because you know like a lot of the social media business world it's like how can you monetize your gifts and that gets really tricky when it deals with spirituality. I think that people should earn an income with their gifts. But I think that we know now like salvation is free. Jesus already paid the price. Um, so I was getting like, uh, more regular, like, oh, with writing my blog and like really showing up. And, um, I had written this blog post about like basically following your heart to, um, build a life filled with love. And I think that night I had this idea. I was like, you should listen to Sam's podcast. Never listened to it before. And I tuned in and I listened and it was your first episode about your, like your new, um, platform of like coming to Jesus and exposing the new age. And I remember I listened to it and I was like, wow, like that's really interesting. And some of the things I told myself were, well, of course we're going to encounter darkness. Like you just have to be spiritually strong. We're the light, you know, and, uh, I don't know. I probably told myself like, Oh, you're not doing it right. (laughs) Or like what you were doing was different than what I was doing. And I felt really uncomfortable for about a week. And I even wrote in my blog post defending myself saying, I listened to this podcast and I'm like, but Buddhism and Taoism helped me understand the Bible more. The Bible's confusing. These things help me understand it because at this point I'm in this space where all paths lead to God, but we know that the path is narrow. It's not true. Um, and they're not all talking about the same thing. Nowhere in the Tao does it say that Jesus died on the cross. Um, of course, you know, Taoism in itself isn't a self-proclaimed religion, but you know, it's a philosophy. It's a way you view the world. It's how you understand right and wrong. Um, so in that way, it really is a religion, in my opinion. Um, but so I was really uncomfortable. And I remember reaching out to a few people, like they asked, like how I was doing. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm really like thrown off. I like listened to this thing. And it like, I don't know, it just, and I tried to go back to my stuff. Like I tried to sit down for a tea ceremony and I just couldn't get in that zone. I tried to do, um, like any like make meditations and other things that I were part of my normal rituals. And I just, it just didn't like feel the same again. And I remember like for a month, I was like, just really quiet. I didn't want to talk to anyone. People were like, what's wrong with you? And I was just like, I don't know. I'm just quiet. Like, and the way that I describe it is that I must have at some point just like softened my heart and said, okay, maybe this is true. And I'm telling you, like at that minute, the Holy Spirit rushed into me and just peeled the scales off my eyes. And that term in the Bible, it is so accurate. My, my, um, it's like, you know, when you watch a movie and it's like, you see someone's life flash before their eyes <laughs> Sorry, spit really quick. And it was like, like all these like spiritual experiences that I had suddenly were replayed in my mind, but for what they really were, the feeling hands all over your body during Reiki, giving Reiki, people leaving their bodies. I remember one meditation I had, um, I had to actually stop and like feel my head, like how I was sitting, because it felt like someone was shoving my head down and like all these things that I dismissed as being like 
this is just spiritual and seeing them for what they were. And I just, I don't know if it was at that point, I like started flipping through the Bible, like just randomly. And every verse I came to talked about astrologers uh, talking about mediumship. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, are you talking to me? You know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and I like the, the last verse I read that was like the nail in the coffin for me um, was in Luke when Jesus says, do you think I came to bring peace? I came to separate you. And I swear when I read it, I read it as the word unity instead of peace, because I really feel like it was speaking to me, like your whole idea of like harmony and unity, it's wrong. Like I'm here to separate the, the wheat from the, is it the chaff? Am I, yeah. you know? And I was just like, I, I think I just, I must've had the dumbest look on my face. And I went, oh, I'm a sinner. Like, and never in my life had I ever understood what people were talking about when they said, you're a sinner and you need a savior. I said, I'm a sinner and I need a savior because had I, I've been so fooled. If I would have just mm -hmm. read this book and opened my heart to God, like I wouldn't have gone through all of this. But at the same time, I was so grateful. I was just like, oh my gosh. It's like those song, Amazing Grace, like you know, I was really lost and I didn't even know it. I wasn't searching. I was just going about my life like da, 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 da. And I, I felt like I had it all figured out. And so that's something that I think is kind of interesting is a lot of the people's testimonies that I hear, they have like this scary traumatic moment where they call out to Jesus. And I didn't have that. It was just like, he came to me and plucked me out of my life and said, you're mine. And it's time to be done doing this. And so I think that there's a lot of people like me, like, yeah, I did a lot of this like philosophy stuff and like energy work stuff, but it's becoming so ingrained in our society that it just doesn't really feel like you're doing anything wrong. So I would say that I'm like the poster child of just being kind of lukewarm, everything, like not really doing anything too bad, not really caring about this too much. Like, let's just all be friends, <laughs> you know? I hadn't gone through a like horrible, you know, traumatic event that brought everything on. It was just, I, you know, it was just very average, you mm -hmm. know, but like, it was like such a profound moment for me. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. I like read the Bible now and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I get this so differently. I understand now why Christians are telling everyone about Jesus and can't shut up about him all the time. And I'm like, that's me now. Like, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I don't have anything better to talk about. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's wild. I experienced the same that when I renounced everything, I came to those realizations of, okay, everything that I was doing was actually sinful. Never in my life did I consider myself a sinner. I knew things that were wrong, like stealing and um, saying the Lord's name in vain and um, drinking and smoking. I knew those things were wrong, but I still didn't consider myself a sinner. I thought I'm a good person. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I had my party days and what have you, but I'm a good person. And then all of a sudden when the Holy Spirit came upon me and the scales were lifted, it's immediately that feeling of I am a sinner in need of a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and you, again, I think that and there's a heavier layer to it when you realize that you had been teaching people for so long mm -hmm. or, you know, um, saying you're going to help someone. And then you just feel, okay, I was bamboozling those people all along. And so there's another layer of that responsibility you feel which is heavy, but at the same time you feel his grace and you feel his forgiveness mm -hmm. and it's instant and you feel so humbled by him. And that, that feeling of reverence that you have for God is like mm -hmm. nothing else. And I also experienced when I would open up scripture, all of a sudden, all the verses were just jumping out at me and piercing me like to my core. It was like all the questions I had were being answered by him. And he was speaking directly to me for the first time in really my life. I thought that through all these spiritual experiences I was having, I was close to God, but I was actually so far from God. And that's what I was really, that's the deception is you really believe. And I have people tell me all the time through my meditations, through the ceremony of work, 
uh, through yoga, that's my time with God. That's where I get close to God. And it's like, no, that is a spiritual practice, a pagan spiritual practice outside of the triune God, God, Jesus, the Holy spirit has nothing to do with, with God. And mm -hmm. it's, it's your own personal spiritual experience that unfortunately you're having with demons. Um, so yeah, when you start opening up scripture and you hear that direct guidance from him, it's that validation you need, especially when you first come out of all things new age and start renouncing it. Because I think there is this moment in time where there's some confusion and you oh, yeah. want deeper understanding. And he thankfully gives you that guidance. Yeah. I definitely had, um, so many times where I'm like, is this real? Like what is going on? And I just felt like, you know, and then I, I think I was telling you before we started talking, um, that I had a friend say like, you're really vulnerable right now. And the scripture that really stood out to me was, um, the parable that Jesus used about, uh, the guard, is it the gardener or farmer, like with, um, the seed landing on good soil. Yes. And I was like, no, I am gonna, this is going to land on good soil. Like I am not losing this chance. And I stayed committed to it. And, um, and that was all by the grace of God. I don't want me to say like, I had the power, the self will I, you know, it, it's amazing. It truly is his grace that I can even walk with him. Um, I remember like after being saved, um, I was like, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, what do I do now? I, I had this hunger to like know scripture. I'm like, I got to devour this thing. Like, it's just like a true hunger and to just know God more and to understand more. And I, um, I, oh, I was like, I don't know what to do. And I felt this urge, like you need to fast for 40 days. So, and that's not like, you know, a flex. I'm just saying like the Holy spirit really was guiding me. Um, so I, this is not going to seem like a big deal for anyone else, but I quit eating anything like sweets and, um, I quit, I, I gave up alcohol. I didn't drink a lot, but like, even, you know, like just having the wine, like here and there, I just like denied myself of that comfort. And for me, like, if anyone knows me, like, I really like my treats. So <laughs> like, that was a big deal. I was never someone like, I can't go on a diet. Like that's too stressful. I need my, like, what's going to be fun if I can't have like a chocolate, which is like, you know, I'm not proud of that, but and I was able, completely able to do it. Like I didn't bat an eye. I was just like, no, don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. And I would wake up at 5 a.m. every morning. I have never been able to have a morning ritual. You know, you'd see everybody like, this is my morning ritual. And I'm like, I can't, I can't. I'm too tired. Like, I don't want to wake up. My butt was out of bed every single morning, five or 530 reading the Bible. And I was like, had the energy. I, I There were some nights... I would just listen to people's testimonies all night and just like really feed myself like that information. Like I needed that confirmation. I, you know, people might feel like we're brainwashed. I was washing my brain. I'm like, I got to get all this stuff out. <laughs> like try to it's time to fill it with the truth. And, um, so there were some nights where I don't even, I don't probably only got a few nights or a few hours of sleep, but I was good. I was fine. Like, it was just like, it was awesome. Like I was just on fire and, you know, I, I heard other people's testimonies talking about, you know, there might be this, this period of spiritual dryness afterwards. And I experienced that too, but I took comfort in knowing, you know, that this might happen. I'm going to stay steady in my faith and my commitment to God and, you know, like you're just, you, ha you have those ebbs and flows and I don't know, it's just been a really beautiful journey. And I, I'm just so happy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I know it's like so hard to describe to people who haven't gone through this experience, but you can't unsee it. Like when the Holy spirit, who is known as the spirit of truth in the Bible, when he reveals this to you, it's like deep within your spirit. It's this knowing all of a sudden, like you have this supernatural knowing and uh, you can't unsee it. You can never go back to it. And you do become so, um, just on fire for Jesus and knowing scripture and being in right relationship with him. And you have this desire to live in righteousness in all areas of your life. It, it's really this beautiful process, sanctification, and it's been such a journey. And I feel like such a baby Christian now, even though I called myself a Christian, my entire life, I feel mm -hmm. like only now after I mm -hmm. renounced all of that witchcraft out of my life, I'm truly getting to know who Jesus is growing in my faith, becoming discipled. 
and it feels so good. It's just mm-hmm. this, this feeling of um, peace, even in the midst of surrendering my entire business and not knowing what's going to happen next and not knowing what I'm going to do with my life and my career. It's like this peace just comes over you and Mm -hmm. you feel that presence of God and that's enough. Yeah. And it's, it's easy to like, look back and be like, wow, you know, I wasted so many years of my life, like on this lie, but you know, if that's what I needed to go through to get to walk with Jesus now and to know the difference, like I'm, I'm grateful for it because, um, I just have like a a totally different, it's just, you don't understand it until you go through it. And it's like, it is, like you said, it's supernatural. It's, I, you know, I just can't even put it into words. It's just like, it's amazing. And, um, and just so grateful. And I'm just so, I'm just so happy, like about like the change and everything. Like, I just go like, God, like, I don't know why you chose me. Like, I'm just so glad that you did. Like, thank you so Mm -hmm. much for giving me another chance, like, and not giving up on me because I wasn't looking for you. Mm -hmm. I thought I had found you and, um, I was pretty satisfied. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so how has your life changed since renouncing everything Mm -hmm. and surrendering to Jesus? Um, I mean, I think that the biggest thing is uh, having like a true peace. Um, There's definitely been like scary moments of sharing my faith with people. And what's kind of funny is when I have been scared and I'm like, no, I need to like, I need to just have courage and share a lot of times people don't care. Like they're like, they're disinterested. They're like, glad you found your truth. Like, and I just, I'm just like, you know, like I was going to deny like God out of fear of your judgment. And it didn't even matter to you. Like, you don't even care. Like you probably just like, you just think I'm a fool. Like, and that's fine. You know, I would have thought the same thing. I probably would have said the same thing. Like, Oh, I'm glad you found your truth. Like do what works for you. And it's like, I don't know. I just, I don't know where my life's going to go, but it just feels really good to be making every decision that I make in a place where I'm connecting with God. I'm asking him for his counsel, um, you know, and just picking up my cross every day, like recommitting my life. If I feel there's been a week where I haven't like been praying as much or, um, you know, sometimes things start to go really good. And then you've, you've kind of forget to talk to God a little bit. And that's all throughout the Bible. Like the reminder of like, I'm, if I bless you, like, don't you think that Mm -hmm. you did this on your own? And Mm -hmm. there's just, it's just this really beautiful cycle of growing and then rehumbling and getting quiet with God and asking him to continue to edify me and just become who I'm supposed to be that how he created me. Um, and that's really what this year has been for me, like just being made new over and over again. And, um, yeah, I mean, like I, I didn't have like a huge energy work business, like, but it, what was interesting is when I quit doing it, I started getting so many inquiries, like for, (laughs) I was like, Oh, come on now. (laughs) Same thing happened to me. Yeah, and I, I had to turn, you know, I turned it all away, but I was just like, like, like for real, like, you're going to come at me like mm-hmm. that. Like, and it was just strange that there were, mm-hmm. a lot, there were really weird spiritual warfare things where it was so cool to be aware of it. Even like this week and this month, like before sh- meeting with you, there was like just the spirit of anxiety around me. Um, and it was like, really like, I didn't have any reason to be there. And I was able to recognize it as being like spiritual warfare, like trying to talk me out of sharing my testimony. You know, there's, there's fears that you have, like with sharing and sharing your story. I don't want people to think that I'm judging them. I don't want, you know, our job is not to convict anyone or, you know, like that's the Holy spirit's job. Like we're just supposed to spread the good news and share our testimony. And, um, I think that's just like what my life looks like right now is, uh, looking for those opportunities to do it and getting more comfortable with it because I do still have a lot of, um, old thought patterns of, you know, I used to be someone who like mocked Christianity. So, um, 
when I find myself saying things, there is still that side of my brain going like, you would have been totally like cringing at this or turned off by it. And I'm just like, you know, God makes mm-hmm. fools of, you know, our intelligence, our, our human wisdom. And uh, it's humbling. Absolutely. There's a verse in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teachings. They will follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. And this has been my experience with sharing my testimony and uh, gently correcting people when they tell me that Christ consciousness is real and that Reiki and all of these things are all in light and love. When I try to gently correct them, I of course just get complete. I mean, it's like the fangs come out. They're not, they're not nice about it. They come at me, they attack Mm me. um, And after they attack me and I come with a rebuttal, they typically block me because they just don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. And um, you do have to have, like you said, when you first heard me talking about all things new age being evil, and I've had this experience in my past as well, I also was very uncomfortable, but didn't know why. Why do I feel so uncomfortable? Why do I feel this resistance around what they're saying? Um, when I first started doing Reiki and someone within my family said, Hey, you know, Christians shouldn't be doing Reiki. This is demonic. Like this is not of God. This is a counterfeit of the enemy. I remember being so angry with that person and thinking you're so ignorant and just not even wanting to talk to them about Mm -hmm. it. And, um, of course now, like looking back, I see what was really happening. Like the enemy had already put his hooks in me and, um, that's the lens I was seeing through. So it's very unfortunate, but absolutely people, you know what, I've come to find that the, you have to grow thick skin when you're a Christian and it's just how it's going to be for mm-hmm. the rest of my life. And, um, there, that's why Jesus talks about in that verse, blessed are those who are persecuted in my name for my name's sake. And he's saying it's going to happen. So don't be surprised when it does. Mm-hmm. And all we can continue to do is really share from our personal experience of what we went through. And I think that that's what's so powerful about speaking to those that are still dabbling in these new age practices is like, we came from that. We, that was our world for a very long time. So you can't tell me that I don't know the difference. And you can't tell me that I would give up my entire business for nothing. Like this is Mm -hmm. how real it truly is. And, um, unfortunately, people, they need to hear it. So whether, you know, they'd like it or not, it is the truth. It's not my truth. It's the truth. And when you open up scripture, that becomes really apparent to you. But I just tell people, you don't have to take my word for it. Pray to God himself. Cause most of these people believe in God. They believe there is a God. So pray to God and ask him to reveal it to you. Ask him, is Jesus really G- God? Is Jesus really God? And are all of these practices really evil? Are they really evil? Uh, and if you do that humbly with an open heart, he will reveal it to you and you'll be quite shocked at how, <laughs> how quickly that happens as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well said. Yes. Amazing. So is there anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, you know, I don't think so. I think like that we covered it really well. And, uh, you know, you just in sharing, if if you're somebody that like wants to share your testimony or is feeling nervous about it, even if a hundred people reject you, you don't know if that seed that you're planting is meant for one person and you don't want to be accountable for that. What are you going to (laughs) do when you're like, Jesus, you know, God is like asking you, like to be accountable for your actions in life and you deny him because of the fear of being rejected and you know don't come at people like in their face because you can't convert people anyways it is truly the holy spirit we're just meant to plant seeds and that one soul that you could be planting a seed for is 100 worth it and because it's worth it to god so 
Amen. Have to have to trust. <laughs> yes. Amen. Yeah. If you're feeling that call from the Holy Spirit, like, okay, maybe now is the time to share and start talking more openly about what I went through in my experience, then mm-hmm. it's time. And there's never a right time. I can promise you that because <laughs> it, it's like saying that you don't want to get married or you don't want to have kids. And because the timing has to be X, Y, and Z, it's the same thing. It will never be the right time. Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, amen. Well, thank you so much, Danielle, for coming on, sharing your testimony. I'm so glad that we were able to finally jump into kind of the topic around Reiki in particular, because I think that, again, there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of people who are saying, well, I'm Christian, I believe in God and I do Reiki and there's nothing wrong with this. So I'm hoping that through our testimony and going through that experience, some people will start to look into it for themselves and go to God and, and really inquire on his opinion on these practices and see what they find. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Thanks for having me.